Welcome everybody. We're delighted to have you here. I think all of you know that the provincial government is planning to hold a public engagement session in quotations on Wednesday, November 17th. And we thought it was important to remind our local and provincial representatives that the residents of Campville and North Granville have a message of our own. So here we are today with our message. Behind me and in front of me, particularly behind me, is the land that the government wants to tear up and pave over in order to build a prison. A prison that will destroy a piece of heritage farmland and forever change not only this landscape, but the character of Campville and North Granville in the process. And all of that without any consultation or discussion with the community before the decision was made. Indeed, it is. It's shocking and shameful. We have a great lineup of speakers, and all of them residents of North Granville with their own unique message. So yes, Mr. Clark, we can think for ourselves. And a theme that you'll find wound through many of their messages is the absence of genuine consultation and the provincial government's failure to be truthful and transparent regarding the details of the proposed prison. CAP, or the Coalition Against the Proposed Prison, is a grassroots collective of Kemptville residents opposing the construction of the Eastern Ontario Correctional Complex. This proposed prison in Kempville is one part of a plan announced by the provincial government in late 2020 to build two new prisons and expand two others in eastern Ontario. Premier Doug Ford has promoted these projects as a solution to overcrowding, as well as claimed that they will create jobs for residents of the towns that they are situated within. Both of these claims have been continually refuted by opponents of the project. Last October, we aired an interview with Colleen Linus, a collective member of CAP, as well as Justin P. Shea of the Criminalization and Punishment Education Project. That interview was conducted at a rally organized outside of Brockville MPP Steve Clark's office. Topics discussed in that conversation include how the plan to build the new prison represents a poor allocation of funds that could be better spent on community and social services. Justin Pichet points out that rather than build more facilities to alleviate overcrowding, government should be examining ways to incarcerate less people. He also points out that the release of many incarcerated people during the early months of COVID-19 did not lead to an increase in crime rates. Colleen explained how many Kemptville residents' initial outrage at the absence of any form of community consultation soon grew into a more nuanced understanding of the harms caused by prisons and the prison industrial complex more widely. If any of our incarcerated listeners are interested in hearing that interview, please get in touch with us and we would be happy to air it again. Earlier this week, I spoke briefly with Colleen to get more information on where their campaign is currently at and learn how we can support them at this moment. So the first thing that I wanted to ask you about was that last fall, CAP organized a rally on the site of the future prison, and this was to raise awareness of the provincial government's virtual community consultation session, which happened shortly thereafter. Can you tell us about how that online meeting went? Yes, certainly. We held a rally on the site just days before that scheduled public consultation, which was held on November 17th. It's interesting just the language that the government sort of shifted. Originally, when they held a similar meeting about a year prior, they had referred to it as a community consultation. The second version was a public engagement session. We had called them out on several occasions to say that true consultation would have required them to have actually consulted with the community before they made the decision to build the prison. And one could argue they should have been also consulting with other experts in the field of criminal justice reform and incarceration to determine whether expanding their ability to incarcerate people was really the best approach. Having said that, the meeting was held. There was a formal presentation followed by a Q&A. The formal presentation was presented by a series of bureaucrats from the Ministry of the Solicitor General and also Infrastructure Ontario. And nothing really new particularly came out of that. 
in terms of the general facts of what they were planning on doing. There were two, I should say, important pieces I'll talk to later, but just generally, there were multiple residents, I think approximately 200 people on the call. We assume most of them were local residents. And with the exception of one speaker uh, who turned out to actually be a very high placed in the federal correctional system, they all spoke out in opposition to the plan. And so it was quite striking. One speaker actually pressed them to acknowledge the level of opposition to the plan in the community asking them to at least put a halt on it and it was an unequivocal no which didn't surprise us because that's kind of been their mantra from day one the two pieces of information that was helpful for us as we move forward one was that we learned that the land they plan to build on is still under the minister of agriculture so just a reminder that this piece of land was part of the kempville agricultural school that dates back to the early 1900s. So we certainly see it as a piece of heritage farmland. And so learning that it actually had not yet been transferred to the Ministry of the Solicitor General was an important piece of information for us. The other was that they also talked about the status of a number of due diligence activities that have to be completed prior to developing the property. And these are activities that are either complete or underway, but we've yet to see any public documents tied to those. So those were two pieces out of a very long (laughs) evening that certainly we have been able to use to continue to move our fight forward. And out of that meeting, it seems that since then you as a group have began two new initiatives to further your campaign. One of those is an email zap and one of those is a fundraiser. Can you tell our listeners more about those initiatives? Absolutely. So in terms of the emails app, after we heard that the land still rested with the Minister of Agriculture, CAP penned an open letter to her asking her not to ask the transfer of those lands from her ministry to the Ministry of the Solicitor General, because we know that once they get their hands on it, it will result in the destruction of heritage farmland. And that has a long history of farming, education, agritourism. The other section of the college that was purchased by the municipality is actually being revitalized as a public square opportunity for agriculture and and other exciting initiatives. And we believe that entire piece of land should be kept in the hands of the municipality or at least another use that would support its agricultural heritage. Um, You know, we're in a time and place where we really can't afford to be destroying our ever-shrinking farmland. So we did not get a response from Minister Thompson, unfortunately, on our letter. And so we decided to make the message a little louder. So we started an email zap about a week ago. And with that, people can go to our website and within a couple of minutes, some just basic information, they're able to send the same message, the same letter under their own name to Minister Thompson as a way of putting increased pressure on her to do the right thing. The other piece of information I mentioned was the due diligence activities. And so we really think that it's critical for people to understand the impacts of the findings of that due diligence work, which includes things like anticipated local transportation impacts, land surveys, environmental assessments. We believe that people should have that information. And so we've actually, a series of people in the community have put forward access to information requests. Our latest GoFundMe, which we also launched last week, is really to help us fund the cost of those freedom of information requests. A single request, one was quoted at $300, and there are currently seven requests in. So it gives you an idea of how expensive it can be just to try to get what we consider to be information that should be made public available not only to the community, but to broader people across the province. Late last year in 2021, I believe it was the fall, CAP saw some pushback from MPP Steve Clark, who went to Elections Ontario and alleged that CAP was, quote, conducting unregistered third-party political advertising. Can you explain the situation in terms of what exactly he was referring to, how you interpret his actions, and whether or not this has affected the campaign in an ongoing way? 
Yes, and thanks for that question. Yeah. That really came out of the blue, and it had happened actually shortly before you folks originally interviewed us last October, and we had been notified by Elections Ontario that, in fact, Minister Clark had submitted a complaint to Elections Ontario. And just to give the context for that, last summer, the provincial government had passed new legislation to enact spending limits on what they refer to as third-party advertising. Anyone spending more than $500 on what was considered third-party advertising within the 12 months prior to a provincial election would have to register as a third party. And that law was struck down originally by the courts and deemed unconstitutional. But the Ford government did go ahead and pass that legislation using the notwithstanding clause of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And although the Ford government had threatened to use the clause previously, that was the first time that any government in Ontario had used that notwithstanding clause. So some of the concerns were that it would be used to try to silence grassroots organizations speaking out on public issues. And lo and behold, that's what did happen to us. Now, when Elections Ontario notified us, they also notified us that he had made this complaint, but they also notified us that they had deemed that there was no merit to it and that what we were doing did not fall under the classification of third-party advertising. So we were relieved to hear that, but certainly very shocked that he would go to those lengths. I mean, we're talking about... We're such a small group. We don't have a lot of money, which is why anything we have to do, we need to do these little fundraising campaigns. And to try to silence us really on just, all, you know, from day one, our priority has been let's get as many facts on the table as possible around all the issues surrounding this prison so that people can make informed decisions around how they see the matter. And lastly, is there anything that you want to let our listeners know in terms of any other actions that you guys have in the works or ways that people can get in touch with you if they're interested in supporting the work that you're doing? In terms of people learning more about not only our campaign, but about the issue, we do have a website and that's cap kemptville c-a-p-p kemptville.ca and we're also on social media twitter instagram youtube and uh, tiktok so we love to have people you know engage on our website and also follow us on social media and where something resonates for them please share with their own networks so in terms of other activities these are the two latest obviously that we've just spoken about this is a critical year for us really wanting to emphasize the broad reasons why this is just bad policy-wise and from a justice perspective and also from an environmental perspective and of course the impacts on prisoners who will be generally coming from the Ottawa area some distance away from family. There's no public transit here. There's a lack of social services and the cultural and religious services that certainly we believe people should have access to. There's also an interesting event coming up in the fall september of this year it's the international plowing match which is in campville and it's being partially held on those lands that they're intending to build the prison on so we're also seeing that as a critical time for us to really again emphasize the irony of promoting sort of the agricultural history of the community and of that site well the next year we know they're going to be going out with an rfp to find a large development company who is going to pave over that land and build a prison on the site. If any of our listeners are interested in supporting either of CAP's current initiatives, I've posted the relevant links on our Facebook and Instagram pages, so please visit those. We have some clips from last year's virtual engagement session, which Colleen was describing. Here's the input of three community members who attended that meeting. Hi there, good evening. I feel like we're still not being taken seriously as citizens of North Grenville. We're just being told that this is happening, and basically you're placating by having these meetings. We're really not getting meaningful discussion out of any of this, but I'd like to just point out that that diagram that was shown by Ali there earlier, in that diagram of the site, I can see the building I was born in, when my, when my grandmother and my father both passed away, that's the Kemple Hospital, as well as the house I lived in for 20 plus years growing up. The schools that I attended, elementary and uh, high school, and the college where my mom taught for 30 years, as well as the fields where I learned to grow food. Um, How can you in all seriousness tell us that this is a good idea, a good choice of site in a time of food scarcity uh, that's increasing, to be using this 
invaluable agricultural land to put this kind of facility on. And I pose that to you, MVP Clark, as well as to anyone representing the Office of the Solicitor General. Thank you. Some of them uh, will be there for two years less a day. And they will be in a facility where there's no access to with public transport. So if their families or friends don't have a car, then they're out of luck. It doesn't matter how beautiful the facility is, they won't have the important support or occasion of visits with their loved ones. How can that be called a humane treatment? The other part of this is when OCDC is undergoing the renovations, I would imagine that you will be hosting more of those inmates in Kempville and the same thing will happen again. They'll be away from their communities in a place where there's no public transit to get to and a lack, a definite lack of social services and other uh, accommodations needed. How can you call that humane treatment of inmates? So I guess my question is for you, Aldi. I don't think the questions are actually being answered, certainly not directly. For example, Len's request for the list of sites, you answered by telling us that they were withheld. We already know that. That's why we're asking for the list of sites. Or Chris Wilson's question about the economic benefits. You know, when you say you think that they will be there, but he's asking for evidence, and so that wasn't responded to. The list of Indigenous groups that were consulted, you say, you know, look into it, but you would think that if you consulted them, you would know the list. You would have it and you would have read it to us. My question about paving over arable land, you answered by talking about the land that is not being paved over. I'm not talking about that land, I'm talking about the land that you are paving. She didn't answer my question. She didn't answer Colleen's request for a simple, straightforward acknowledgement that the cost to North Grenville will not be zero. You did say, well, they won't be major costs. You finally sort of tried to answer, but you didn't give a straightforward answer. You didn't answer Justin Pichet's question about what you're going to do about Elizabeth Fry's opposition to the prison, because you talked about where female prisoners will be located. That, that wasn't an answer. You didn't answer the question about where the staff will come from, because you answered by telling us that it will be a mix of staff with guards and other professional services. The question was, will you undertake to ensure that if you did build this prison, that we will employ local people? So you didn't answer that question. You also keep repeating that this is very early in the process to be talking to people, but I can't imagine, and I don't know how it's possible, that you would say that it's in the public good, that what you're doing is in the public good, without having consulted beforehand. How do you know it's in the public good? You haven't asked us. Instead, you're just saying, oh my God, we're doing a great job by talking to you sooner than we usually do. But that just means another project you had no clue what the community wanted, and you claim to know what the public good is. 